Hello and welcome to the Southbound Sports Show. I'm your host, Richie Leahy, here with my co-host, Matty B. Big news out of Pittsburgh today. Duck Hodges is going to be the Pittsburgh Steelers starting quarterback against the Cleveland Browns on Sunday, giving him a glowing review and a boost of confidence heading into the game is Mike Tomlin. And Mike Tomlin says that he went with Duck because he has not killed us, which I don't know how you can be confident as a quarterback going into the game and getting that review from your coach. Like, ah, you know what? Uh, He's a great leader. He makes a lot of great passes. We can rely on him in the run game, spreading the ball around. Like, no, you just um, you haven't killed us yet like Mason Rudolph has with the turnovers, basically is what he's saying. So as a fan, I don't know how to feel. I, I feel like Hodges definitely runs the offense better. I see a lot more movement with them. They're able to move the ball down. They had one big breakaway play for the touchdown against Cincinnati. But at that point, they had already dug themselves a hole. And it's the NFL. I don't expect them, even though the Bengals don't have a win, I didn't expect that to be a blowout in favor of the Steelers. Because most games, if you look at the Vegas lines, they're going to be close. But I didn't expect them to come out and look so horrid on offense. I know they had injuries, so I think this is a well, I guess, basically much-needed switch at quarterback. Matt, what are your thoughts? Well, I I think when Tomlin said he's not killed us, he's recognizing that this team right now is 100% relying on the defense and generating turnovers and give, and winning the field position game. They've gone back to traditional Pittsburgh formula for winning. Don't let – put your put, – I mean, it's essentially – it's guilfering. Just manage the offense enough to score enough to, to get the field goals to win the game. You don't have – no one cares if you win pretty or you win big or blow people out. They just want wins. That's all that matters. Score one more point than the other team. And I think that, the, I mean, you, you look at the, the plays that Duck made. He had the one long touchdown pass to Washington. Outside of that, he didn't really do anything. It was like 5 of 11, like 34 yards, I think. Yeah, it was like really the, the, close. It was like 50% it, or less than 50%. Yeah, it was a crack. And, and honestly, watching the game, I thought, you're going to blow this game to the Bungles. And completely ruin your chances of the, at the playoffs. And I was actually surprised that they pulled the trigger and benched Mason Rudolph. My thoughts watching Rudolph was, was there some form of concussion or lingering effects, distractions from the the Miles fight that had him not prepared or not focused for the game? I don't even think it's that. I said it last week on the show, and not a lot of people are talking about it. I didn't see the leadership skills in that fight for an NFL quarterback, and that's a big part of the locker room stuff. You have to be able to be a leader, and if you're not at that point, you kind of have to be a quiet guy. Otherwise, your team's not going to rally around you. So, like, I saw a clear spark when Hodges went into the game. Before that, it was almost like the offense was expecting a turnover or something bad to happen. And when you're making bonehead decisions, like getting into a position where you're getting hit in the head with your own helmet, uh, what are the other players on your team supposed to think? I said that last week. Go stand on the sideline and yell. Like You can do other things during that fight. Like Once you got up off the ground, he grabbed your helmet. Run over to the sideline, do some up, something else, grab some of your own players to like pump them up. Don't run up to them and get hit in the head. And I might be in the minority talking about it that way, but that's not what I like to see. I'd rather see a fighter that's going to go out there and pull together. Uh, I look at what's happening in Cleveland with Baker Mayfield. He has a lot of the press on him. He's doing like a lot of publicity stuff, and he's he's doing like the cocky in the press, like, hey, blah, 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 this is my game. I'm going to do all this stuff. He hasn't really shown it, but the players still seem to rally around him because guess what? He's not doing crazy look-at-me things during the game, get hit in the head with other with his helmet. 
So I don't even know if I was looking at the two people were saying like, oh, Baker Mayfield, that's not going to work out because of so-and-so stuff or his demeanor and things he's doing. He's dressing strange, like home alone and stuff like that. that that's never going to work in the NFL. And then on the other hand, you have Mason Rudolph not doing any of that weird stuff off the field, but on the field looking like an idiot. So what am I supposed to say? Who, who would I rather have lead my team? I just don't know. He's not making a ton of money, so I don't think they cut him. I just don't know. I think at this point, the, the coaches said that they got together. They felt like Hodges gives them the best chance to win. And I think that's it for Rudolph as a Steeler. I honestly do. Do you feel the same way? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that, that could be. Um, I, I think going back to your point about the spark, I definitely think you saw you saw something there, and it may have just been that there was absolutely nothing, or that they were just exhausted from having Rudolph back there. But there was definitely some. There was enough of a spark that they got the points that they needed and and were able to pull out the win. Yeah, speaking of the win, your man Bud Dupree. I wanted to make sure I hit on this before I forgot the game winning fumble, and he recovered it. At the end of the game, Bengals had the ball. We're doing whatever. And I, I, I put a feeler out to some people, and I got a lot of people that hate Bud Dupree and how he hasn't done anything until this year. I know you talked about it on the show, uh, how it's a contract year. but Got to get that money in the contract year. But like I said, maybe he's a guy they can re-sign. I wonder if he's going to get a lot of outside interest based on just this one season. I don't know. He's really making a name for himself late. And we'll see. I wonder what kind of offers he's going to get or if it's someone that other teams look at and say, you know what? It just seems like too too, too little too late. Like, you know what I mean? He, he did, did good on a decent Steelers team, not knocking it out of the world, but we're not going to give him like a gigantic deal. And he could end back, back with the Steelers. I have a feeling that that might happen. That just they get him at a you. discount. If this is how good he's going to play in a contract year, just send him to a one-year deal next year. Give him more money and just say one year. That that worked with Le'Veon Bell. <laughs> <laughs> just keep giving the one-year deal until he goes crazy and snaps. That seems to be the way to go. Um, oh, I forgot to mention it. The, the pinata. Cleveland fans. I like how they're stepping up their game in the rivalry. It's been... So depressing for so long there. You have seasons where you don't get a win. You, you get all these hype players coming in and it's not working out. Right now you're five and six, I believe. And you have some wins for the first time. And they had a pinata at their game, a Mason Rudolph pinata, and they were swinging helmets at it, which I found hilarious. So good on you to go ahead and do that. I know they were like, there's some press releases coming out or some things that leaked from the internal investigation and other allegations thrown around. They, they find Rudolph 50 grand, which was the most of any other player, which I didn't understand. But I, I mean, I guess he doesn't make that much money compared to like what Miles Garrett did. And he's out indefinitely. So he's going to lose game checks more than what Rudolph did. He didn't, wasn't out of game. So I was basically fine with everything of that. And I thought it was funny that they would bring a pinata of him and hit. This game's going to be intense. And to be honest, I'm glad Rudolph's not going to be a part of it right now because I feel like he would fall apart. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I, I do think there's a lot riding on the game, but I, I just think with the way that Hodges played, I thought when, when Rudolph went out with his concussion or brain puncture whatever in his mind and Hodges played I didn't think that Hodges played poorly and should have been replaced I, I believe he ride the hot hand and in the spot where he was at uh, it, it almost just seemed forced and then when Rudolph came back he had that false sense of entitlement and it ended up costing them some consistency because they went from Hodges back to Rudolph and I, I don't think that it benefited them yeah I was looking at it 
from a perspective of offensive play calling. And it was clearly different between the two where they weren't taking as many deep shots downfield. And I think that's something that hurts Rudolph. And maybe that's a decision that he's making. But come on, bro. You don't have to throw every ball down the field. What are you doing? Take some checks where I feel like that's where Hodges is able to spread the ball around a little bit more. And I don't mean in terms of, oh, he threw two more receivers because I'm sure someone will text me and say, look, the stats prove that Rudolph spread the ball around more. I mean, he's hitting passes in different zones. He's, he's not afraid to check it down, check it down, check it down, and keep the drive alive by keeping the chain short. If you're throwing the first two downs, you're taking deep shots that are incomplete, you're putting yourself in third and long situations, and then you're not converting, you're punting, and then the defense is going to get tired. So it's just something that more of, I don't want to say it's more of a ball control thing, but I feel like Hodges is more in control of the game. And I think it benefits the Steelers whenever they play like that. It's more of the old school, early Ben Roethlisberger days where you rely on the defense, you keep the ball. It's a different style of offense. It's not like you have Bettis back there, eating clock, pounding at the line and breaking some plays. I mean, you had that kind of quick, small wide receiver set back in the day. Bring that type of play calling back. It worked. Get your defense some rest. Clock stops if you're if you're throwing swing passes incomplete and things like that. That's what I want to see. You mean all those screen passes that Haley wanted that everyone lost their mind about? I've never been against screen passes. <laughs> I like I like more of an air raid style, you know that Mike Leach type, where you're spreading the ball around, short, quick passes mixed in with runs, because it keeps the defense off balance. And I mean, look what the Ra- Ravens are doing. Well, we're going to get into them in a little bit, but I mean, they spread the ball around, and it's working out well. And they they could be the favorite going into the playoffs. But anything else you want to hit on the Steelers before we go around the NFL? No, I think we're good. All right, big one. Our boy John Gruden, right there, could have been in the driver's seat for the playoffs. Does us a favor by getting killed by the Jets. And I looked at it, and I thought, why? What? What? What is going on? I had the Jets down as that's a pretty sure win for the Steelers coming down down late in the season. You have the Bills playing out of their minds, Jets, and then you have the Ravens, and I'm sure from get, forgetting somebody. But you're looking at that schedule and you think, okay, they had to win the Jets game. And the Jets just poured on the Raiders, and I have no idea why that game was a non-compete. Like, John Gurren, what are you doing that you're going to let the Jets just control your game? You should never... They're paying you $10 million dollars you have a better team. You should never be getting blown like that, blown out like that. What are your thoughts on that game? Did you see any of it? I didn't see any of it, but I saw that they were getting tattooed, and I just think when when you're – what it looked like was it was one of those situations where they got down, and then you try to dig yourself out of the hole all in one play, and one bad, one bad move leads to another, leads to another, leads to – it gets you off your game plan instead of you just focusing on on your game plan and doing what you need what you need to do to get back into it. You start trying to to pull at random things that are outside of what you need to do, and it just it just makes it worse. I also think that when they looked at that, I'm sure a lot of players just took that for granted and took it as just all right. That's a mail in win, not recognizing that you actually have to play the game and actually finish it. That's true. I'm actually surprised around the league, not just at the Jets, but at these bottom teams that are winning and trying to win. Like, what would have benefited the Bengals if they beat the Steelers? I understand that's a rivalry game, maybe pride, but outside of that, what are you doing? I mean, look at the Redskins. They win a game that they could have easily lost and held one of those top two draft picks. And then, of course, you have Haskins. He goes out, misses the last snap of the game because he's taking selfies with fans on the sideline. Didn't realize that they had the ball and they had to take a knee. 
crazy. I don't know if you saw that. Joe Theismann, for whatever reason, he's still around in the press. I believe it was him. He started to attack him. And I'm thinking, no wonder the Redskins have trouble when they just have old hanger-on quarterbacks, like just hating on the team. Like that just feels like something that a team living in the past would do. But you know, when you look at the Redskins, they have Dan Snyder, and he's like the anti-nutting. He's just like, who's the best player? I'll buy him. I'll buy all of. I'll buy all of the free agents. <laughs> that doesn't work in football, though. There's a salary cap. But it doesn't like it doesn't seem like he cares. It's just like whoever the whoever the top free agents are, he's buying them. You don't They're think to- that if if he bought the Pirates, the Pirates would be in a better position? They couldn't be worse. <laughs> you know they would immediately be in the playoff race every year because buying the top players usually gets you somewhere. What happens is whenever he gets stuck in the NFL with the salary cap on poor contracts and dudes like way past their prime. Like, let's bring in Clinton Portis. He's still around, right? Like, that wasn't that one of his big contracts back in the day? Yeah, there was him. Antoine Randall was signed to a ridiculous contract. Yep. Yeah, that hurts you in the NFL. In baseball, that doesn't matter at all. So don't you dare compare him to nothing. I would love to have him as a Pirates owner because I know he would get it done. But I think like the, the he Snyder's the kind of owner that people that are like just diehard Pirate fans are going to point at and say, you can't just throw money at the problem. There has to be other issues because you have guys like Snyder that just throw money at it and it doesn't work. Should should you use the word diehard Pirates fans? Don't you mean like naive Pirates fans or blinded Pirates fans that are you just going to follow think, whatever the, the mainstream, they, would, whatever would they, they tell you? Pirates. They get their marching orders and they'll go ahead and just repeat it. Like, hey, it's too, we're just too small market, Matt. Too small market. Didn't you see the market size? I mean, the, then Major League Baseball told us we're too small of a market. To compete. So just keep paying, go down, get your coleslaw sandwich, and be happy. Because that park's really nice. That's basically the manifesto of a Pirates fan. And you can hate yeah. on it all you want, but I'll go back. Dan Snyder, yeah, he's dug himself some holes. Is, that, is he ever going to win? Probably not. But like, it doesn't help that you have old players just calling out your young rookies. Instead of like trying to like guide them along, like why don't you give him a call? Why are you bashing him on Twitter or like in the media? It makes zero sense. Instead of saying like, "Hey, you know what, buddy? Let me help you. I want to. I want a Super Bowl here." I think he did, didn't he? I know he broke his leg. That's all I know. But I'm sure I'll get torn apart on my facts. Like you idiot, don't you remember 1980, 82? And I'm like, no, I don't. Um, yeah, he did because Joe Gibbs is one of, he's the only coach to win three Super Bowls with three different quarterbacks. And th- then I have a fact I could be wrong because I'm remembering it now, but wasn't it like every win he's had was off of a strike? Cause he like, br- I, he paid to bring in like the best guys. So his starters could rest throughout the season. I believe that's true. Well, that and the the players on their own would would organize practices so that whenever like they were running player run practices during the strike so when they came back everyone was pretty much running like the offense and defense that they needed to but it was player run as opposed to like coach run and on the on the nfl dime well that reminds me talking about the nfl stuff what the hell was going on with nfl.com I was watching one of the games and I thought, you know what? I'm going to see what their stats are. I go to their website and I'm immediately hit with a bunch of clickbait articles. I forget which game it was something, one of the games and it was talking about the quarterbacks and it gave me like this pop-up and I, I think it was on my phone and it said like, Hey, all 32 NFL quarterbacks ranked Tom Brady, not in the top 10. So I was like, I don't want to click on this, but I should click on it to talk about it on the show. So I did. And 
Matt, it was like a week or two out of date. And I thought, why are you promoting this to me? Like, you're talking about Tom Brady like two weeks ago. And I'm like, give me up-to-date stats. And if you're putting this together, you have to be leaving Tom Brady out for whatever reason. He should easily be the number one quarterback until someone takes over by winning multiple Super Bowls. Who else is winning multiple Super Bowls? No one. I mean, come on, give me a break. I don't care about all these stats. And I looked at, um, I think they had, it was a couple weeks ago, so they still had Carr ahead of them. And their stats were almost identical. And and they had Carr like fifth or sixth. And they had Tom Brady like 11th. And I thought, why? Tom Brady has a better record. Like what head-to-head are you giving Carr? But honestly, though, that doesn't surprise me. Because of clickbait. I just, Matt, I just want news. Like they're, they should not have staff writers that are just writing clickbait articles on NFL.com. All you need are like analytics type articles or like some of the player insights. Cause you know, they can get actual player insights before anybody else in the industry. They should have their own Adam Schefter or whatever, because the owners just call them and say, Hey, put this on our website. That would be a hundred percent more effective than whatever the hell they're doing. Because I was embarrassed to be reading this. I thought, that's no better than ESPN. If I wanted weird lists and things like that, I'd just go to ESPN.com. And their site was slow. Like, come on, speed it up. Like, make it faster. It's not even di- that dynamic. So that's my other mini rant in the middle of the show. I don't even know if you look at it. I just want one site that's fast. ESPN is so slow to get the scores. I just want a fast site that loads the scores. If you, had, if you know one and you listen to the show... Send it to me, please. I've tried all the major ones, Fox, CBS, NBC. They're all garbage. You have to load like 30 ads on my, on my phone. If I'm out doing something and I just want the score, I cannot get it for fast. Maybe we'll look into it for our own site. We'll see. See what we can get. Just give me the scores. That's all I need to know. Um, I had la- one last tidbit here. Lamar Jackson. The dude is putting up numbers. Where if you look at it from a point, I thought Russell Wilson should be MVP. But I don't know how you can leave Lamar Jackson out. Did they split the award? I mean, I don't even know. But I, I, I can't fault either quarterback for getting it. But Jackson's just been unbelievable because you know what? Greg Roman has that quarter, that system where they ran in 49ers out there with Colin Kaepernick. And they have like tailored it more towards the college game now. So he's like a perfect fit. I thought he was going to be getting hit. They're putting him in situations just to run out of bounds. He'll gain like 15 yards and run out of bounds. And I'm like, how's he going to get injured if he never gets hit? They're moving him around. It's, I'll I'll say, it looks beautiful to watch, but as a Steelers fan, it's very painful. Because I'm like, oh my God, how are we going to stop him? Week 17, like, it's not going to be pretty. We just need to f- trade for Montez Burfitt. <laughs> you joke, but I wouldn't be surprised if something like that would would come down. They're just, like, trying to up the level of the rivalry. Now, nah, Bud Dupree will hit him. He's a contract year. He don't care. You know what we need? We need to get Ray Lewis on the phone and give us some of that deer, like, deer antler spray. I was thinking about that. You haven't heard about that in a while. Clemson used, what, Osterine last year? That old lady osteoporosis, like drug or whatever that they said was in their shampoo. Like, just give them the deer antler spray. Bring it back. Have your guys ready to go and just win. Because I have a feeling with the Raiders imploding and what other teams? The, the Titans blew out the Jaguars. So they're right there now. I'll see if I can bring up the actual standings. I'm looking at the AFC playoff picture. Steelers right now are back to being the sixth seed. You have New England and Buffalo. Unless things drastically change, Bills are going to get one of the wild cards. And then you have Ravens. They're going to be, they're probably going to have home field advantage. I don't know if they'll catch New England. New England would have to drop one. I don't know if that happens. And then you have the Steelers battling with the loser of the AFC South and the loser of the AFC West, which right now are the Colts 
and the Raiders. So if the Raiders keep blowing games to losing teams and then the Colts keep struggling down the stretch, Steelers could back into a playoff position because I think the AFC this year is so poor, it's unbelievable. Like I have no idea. Like looking around, if you compare it to the to the NFC, they have like a similar issue where you have the top heavy 49ers and the Seahawks in the West. Then you have the Saints. The North has the Packers and the Vikings. And then the East is a slugfest now with New Eng- or not New England, Philadelphia struggling. And the Cowboys. Like who even wants in? I feel like the league is kind of top heavy this year. And so if you're a gambling man, see if you can take a bet right now. I don't know if it would actually pay off. If you just bet on the top four teams, 49ers, uh, New England, the Ravens, and then possibly, I mean, you'd be down. You got to think either the Saints or the Seahawks, whichever one of those two, and see if it would pay out. Hell, maybe even just put a, a grand on each all five. I mean, the odds right now in week whatever, 12, have to be decent compared to waiting to the playoffs to put your bets in. You might be able to hedge those for some wins. I don't know. I just don't see a wild card coming in and winning at all. Although, I do have one question for you. Do you think the Ravens season would be a disappointment if they lost their first playoff game? I would say yes. I mean, at the rate that they're playing, they should they should contend for a Super Bowl. And I, if they don't get it with the weapons that they have, when are they going to? True. I almost look at it like the, the Chiefs. You had a dynamic offense. Once you got into the playoffs, they had that shootout with the Patriots. Now everyone has them figured out. Like, where do they go from here? I don't know. Was losing Hunt that big of a... I mean, a loss for that offense? I don't know. It seems like all the weapons are still there. They're just not getting it done. But Yeah, I don't... you have anything else for the NFL? Um, no, not so much with the NFL this week. The games were just kind of played out as as is. Oh, I did. I was going to put in... Um, I uh, I got some got some responses from some fans. They were saying that I complained too much about fantasy football, and I thought, well, fantasy football is going to be wrapping up. If your regular season hasn't wrapped up yet, it should be wrapping up in the next week or two. Go ahead and and get some excuses. These are some of my favorite ones that I always use. Uh, too many injuries this year, and that's very easy to back up. You can just take a screenshot of your team and just show all the guys that have been injured and said, man, my team was really killing it the first couple weeks of the season until I had all those injuries. Another favorite is that uh, so-and-so player, uh, they just, they fell apart. Blame it on one of the players. They don't know how, no other people, uh, let's look at this. If you're playing in a fancy league, no other person in that league is going to be looking at your roster. Just blame it on one of your guys. I think uh, most of the fantasy, they have like a, a graph that shows you points by week. Find one of your guys that just has a downward graph. Take a screenshot of that. Send it to your league and say, look, this guy fell apart. My team fell apart. Nothing I could do. What do you want me to drop him? You want me to drop Patrick Mahomes? Like, what am I supposed to do? He just fell apart. Got hurt. Dealing with some injuries. Those are some of your top tier um, excuses. And it really helps if you're a past champion. Because then you can just point like, hey, I'm I'm a two-time champ. Like, I don't know what to tell you. I can't win it every year. That, that's my final one that I always put out there. You have any tips, Matt? No, because <laughs> as a champion, I don't make excuses. But I will say that what I've noticed for teams to go deep in the playoffs, uh, I do think you have to win the waiver wire. And trying to find I, – I, I feel like the teams that really are successful – are the teams that you find that running back, especially in a league like ours, it's PPR. If you can get a, a running back or receiver that you sign late, that's going to pick up over 10 points a week for you, that's a huge get. 
especially in a deep league like ours where you those players are not easily accessible. That's why I will say rest in peace, Will Disley. You really hurt my team this year. I picked you up off waiver wires, and you helped me get into that number one power ranking, and then you just you just got hurt. Like, let's be a little bit careful next year if I pick you up. That's a perfect example of how you can scapegoat a player on your team into why you didn't win. So keep that in mind. Take a look at your team, find one guy that gets hurt, falls off a cliff, especially like Matt said, if it's a waiver wire pickup, it makes you look even better. Like, hey, when I picked him up off the waiver wire, he was average at 20 points a week. I, I'm a genius. I can't help but he gets hurt. So keep that in mind as we transition here. And the high tap, we moved it to the middle of the show. What are you saying? Don't be an excuse maker. Hey, sometimes the champion can't win every year, Matt. What I say? Two-time champion can't win it every year. <laughs> you just fall back on that. You just uh, make sure you buy yourself like a Top Gun hat when you do win it or some type of champion gear that you can just always wear. And then you just have to remember like, uh, when did I win it again? If it was more than like five to 10 years ago, you probably don't want to talk about it because that's kind of embarrassing. That's getting into like, you're looking like a, a Notre Dame fan at that point. Like, remember whenever we used to win it? Yeah. Yeah. All right. We, we used to win. Didn't I? Didn't they have some championships? That's what you have to say. So don't go to that. Don't go that route. Um, high tempo. First one before I get it, see if you have anything else you want to add. Marcus Smart, for a player for the Boston Celtics in the NBA, uh, he, he had some issues with fans at Oklahoma City, or Oklahoma State when he was in college, I mean. He goes to the NBA. He got his leg stuck in a chair in the front row. And this is my problem with the NBA. You want to limit fan interactions? Don't let fans sit there. Why is a fan sitting in a foldable chair down by the three-point line? Like, it makes zero sense to me, right off the bat. So, to me, the NBA is at fault. The owners are at fault. He gets his leg stuck in the chair. After the game, he said that the guy had some words for him. And it's only a matter of time before players, uh, what do they say, protect themselves or defend themselves. And I thought, from what? I watched the video. The guy kind of helped him and like patted him on the back, and that was it. But he said that the guy said, stay on your knees or something like that to him. And I thought, what are you talking about? What are you defending yourself from, words? You're a million-dollar athlete. That guy, he paid big dollars to get down there, and they've been kicking people out of games. And at this point, it's almost like a big clown show. Why? The players are on the court. If the, if the owners are going to put people there, fans... They should expect to get ribbed a little bit. That's not even that bad of a slam to the point where he's thinking of punching the guy in the face because that's what I think he means by protecting themselves or defending themselves, whatever he said, is that he's going to take a swing at the guy, right? I, well, yeah, he's got to defend himself from those words. Yeah, I can't, I can't read it any other way. Like if I was a fan at this point, it's getting ridiculous where I don't know how fans aren't leaving the games. Football fans, they would never put random football fans down by the field. Could you imagine? I mean, they used to have, like even college, they used to have like students and people down on the field because you see people celebrating with them in old videos. They would never do that now because all it would take is Woody Hayes to just take a swing, clock one of the players, clock one of the fans, and it would be all over. They'd never do that. Woody Hayes ruined it for everyone. Remember that in Rivalry Week right now. Woody Hayes. Punch that Clemson player. Ruined it. Now fans have to be up up above where they can't interact at all. Hockey can't interact. They have that glass glass ring around. So NBA, do something like that. Put an artificial barrier if the players can't take it. I don't I don't know. I think it would make it more intense if they put like a hockey plexiglass ring around for fans to bang on. I think that would be a cooler look for the NBA. It it protects your fans. <laughs> Protects the players. Like, oh, and the, then you could bounce them off the wall too. You just push them into the wall. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Then, then, but really, you don't have to worry about your players getting their ankles broke by landing in a chair. There's no chair there. The wall would break their fall if they hit their head off it or whatever. No big deal. Like, put some padding on it. They like they have the padding underneath. Oh, I guess that's more like high schools or whatever that they have the old school hoops with like the 
the ball <coughs> going into the ground. But that was one of my big ones. I thought, what are you talking about? Uh, I think we hit on the second one before, but it came back up in the news because ESPN did it outside the lines on it. They said that college trainers are alleging coaches are influencing metal de- medical decisions. And Penn State and Texas A&M were two of the schools that were named. I believe we had this scoop a while ago talking about Penn State where an old trainer came out and said that James Franklin was kind of like pressuring and it might not have even have been him. It might have been some other coaches on the staff. They were pressuring on the trainer to clear some of the athletes from their injuries. And I don't know how you can prove that. I mean, unless you have sound bites, it could just be sour grapes from the trainers. I'm trying to look at it from a neutral perspective. If I if I was like the NCAA and I got this complaint, I would say, what is your proof? Like, how can you prove to me that this happened? Because number one, you can talk to the players. They might not say anything because it could have been the coach protecting the player from maybe an NFL scout. Because I look at some of the things that Harbaugh's done at Michigan where Jabril Peppers gets hurt, holds him out of the bowl game. He doesn't say anything because he doesn't want to hurt his draft stock. And that happened with a couple players in Michigan. Uh, a couple guys got hurt late in the season. I think Devin Bush was one of them. Had a hip injury or something. I don't think he played in the bowl game last year. Uh, Harbaugh never really came out and said much. They kept asking him about it. He just kept saying no comment. And worked out. Steelers traded up for him. He's been awesome for the Steelers. Could you imagine if Harbaugh said, you're like, yeah, he's had this nagging hip injury all year. Like that might have scared some teams off. Steelers might not have got him. Might have ended up at the Patriots or the Ravens. So uh, I want to see more data. And you're a coach. What do you think of this? I, like, Isn't it on the trainers? Well, there's, there's two parts to this. The first part is that you're really taking on a huge liable risk if the coach is saying, hey, clear this person. Now, with that being said, you have a lot of trainers, and especially ones that are you know, the, the Division One and, and even higher, you know, going into the NFL, that they're not going to risk their medical license on some of these players. So the, the typical stance that you see is when a player is facing some kind of injury, they're looking at uh, immediately missing some form of time for at least a little bit. If it's not a game, if it's not multiple games, you know, they're going to err on the side of rest, recovery, make sure you're 100% before returning to play. With that being said, players have different levels of pain tolerance. And I think, are there coaches who try to push that issue, knowing that based off of knowing players and knowing how they respond, that maybe they can get more out of practice? I think if trying to push the envelope that way could could turn some of that. But I know for myself personally, I would never risk that because – in that off chance that you guess and you guess wrong, it's going to cost you your career. And I would never, or more importantly, it could cost you the health of one of your athletes. And so I think those are, those are the two reasons why you, unless you have that medical background, you just defer to your medical staff and let them handle it so that it kind of takes that aspect of it off your plate. And I'll say that I could transition this right into my last one. In high tempo, DJ Durkin still the highest paid. I don't. I guess a staff member, state employee at the University of Maryland. They have a uh, website that's supposed to keep the state system. I uh, what did it say? Held accountable. I put it on our Twitter. You can follow that. If you go to our website, southboundsports.com, it has all of our stuff. But they had the payments from state monies. I think it. Was, I think it was state monies because some coaches have like booster money payouts. He's getting more than the president. He's not even there anymore. You know what? If he would have had a cause to fire him, he wouldn't get paid at all. But when it came down to it, he had said that he wanted them to hire another physician to be on staff with the trainers. He must have had documentation to back that up because I would imagine a lot of coaches just email their admins or at least whatever to keep a paper trail. He obviously had that because otherwise they wouldn't be paying him. So that's why if you're a coach, make sure you put it on the training staff and say, look, this is what I want. 
This is what I need to do. If the school wants to cheap out on you, you got to protect yourself. And that goes as a player too. Put it in writing, say like, hey, I don't feel 100%. And you're right. Sometimes different pain tolerances, you don't know. I've always felt that I've had a high pain tolerance compared to other people, like playing on sports teams with them. You have like similar injuries and they're out for like three weeks. And I'm just keep playing because I'm like, whatever. So at some point it's going to be on the player, but you don't want to just keep playing through that. Uh, Speaking of playing through injuries, the two injury, someone said that, oh, you're wrong. He got injured in the second quarter, not the third quarter. Who cares? He was already injured going into the game. They were up five touchdowns. He was five for five going into that game. Who cares if I messed it up that it was the third quarter or the second quarter? Why is he in? He was limping the entire game. You can't tell me that a guy with his elusiveness, if he was 100%, he would have got chased down like that from behind and landed awkwardly on his hip. That never would have happened if he was 100%. That's why it's a freak injury because no one ever gets tackled like that because they usually have the burst to break out of that or at least turn a little bit or whatever, but he was limited. Don't put him in that position. Don't put him in that position. If you're going to play him hurt, like Byron Leftwich, uh, was that him that got carried down the field in like one of those highlights? Or am yeah. I thinking of someone else? I, I, I think it was Marshall, wasn't it? Yep. Uh, at the University of Marshall, not a different quarterback. It was Leftwich, I'm pretty sure. He, uh, Whenever you're hurt like that, you're going to have to just throw quick passes. You're not going to be expected to scramble around. But for whatever reason, that's why I said it's 100% on the coaching staff. They can give whatever excuses they want. Uh, Two-minute warning. I think that's what people were saying that I uh, I said two-minute warning because it was the end of the second and they wanted to do one more drill. So it was actually like a simulated end of halftime two-minute. Who cares? Why does he need that practice? The dude won a national championship, like I had said. All of my points still stand. So um, let's get into, uh, I guess it could be considered ACC talk, Matt. Miami, the U, dancing on the sideline. While they are losing to FIU, Florida International, the real you. What are you doing? What are your thoughts on that? Well, it definitely takes it. On one hand, it takes the sting out of losing to Miami, but on the other hand, it makes that loss a thousand times worse, and it adds fuel to the fires to to my feelings about Willie Taggart being fired, because if Florida International with lesser with lesser talent lesser recruits was able to do that there's no reason that it couldn't have been done at florida state and as far as the the dancing and the the antics on the sideline i think that goes with miami but the issue is when you're the type of team that does that kind of stuff and that's that's kind of like miami's thing that you know they're going to have the antics and the, the touchdown rings and the turnover chain and when you do those kinds of things and you're winning like the teams in the 80s did, no one's going to bat an eye. That's just part of your identity. But when you act that way, and, and this is something that I try to, to push off on my high school team, if you act that way and then you can't back it up, you look like a clown. And so that's <laughs> why there's more teams that that push to do the Saban-Belichick route of just be humble, just be modest, don't don't flaunt and flash all that stuff because then when you get humbled, it doesn't look as bad. You know, Alabama loses to LSU. They're not dancing on the sideline. Where are they, where are they at? They're number five. They're on the outskirts of making a college football playoff. So there, there's, there's a rationale behind handling your business and, and not adding unnecessary fuel or unnecessary pressure because with all that dancing, all it does is it calls extra attention when you get your ass handed to you. And it's worse than that. People are looking at Manny Diaz and they're like, how do you grade this season? You beat your rival in Florida State. That's a big plus. But the FIU loss is worse than anything. Like, could you imagine? I Look at it from Michigan's perspective. If Harbaugh beat Ohio State, but lost to Florida International, the narrative goes from, Oh, you can't beat your rivals, even though you beat the rest of them. You just can't beat Ohio State because they're always like ranked higher than you. So you'd have to pull off the upset. You just haven't been able to pull off an upset. Two, holy crap, you beat those guys, but then your team was so ill prepared. 
Like, what kind of coach does that make you? Beat the teams you were supposed to beat. To me, that's good coaching. Eventually, go ahead. This was an issue I had with it was they interviewed Diaz about it, and he said, well, we have – we have roster issues and we have we have culture issues and trying to downplay it and like sweep it under Mark Rich regime. But it's like, wait a minute, you were defensive coordinator on that staff. You were part of that. You're the current head coach and you're allowing that to happen because I believe it was Jimmy Johnson said, You either coach it or you allow it to happen. And and it's definitely something that it, it brings recruits in. But by losing to FIU, Florida or Miami also had several players decommit from them. So it, it's actually it's amazing me that for as as rough as I think Florida State's shape is right now with their coaching search and the issues that they're having, it amazes me more that the other schools in Miami aren't capitalizing on it and taking advantage of of the recruiting opportunities. Well, that's where I was going to go with it, comparing Harbaugh and I was going to bring in James Franklin. You have coaches like that that came in almost, I don't think, well, Penn State had the sanctions, so they're a little bit different of a situation. But you have Franklin come in, they're not really losing games they're not supposed to lose. You're losing to the top teams, and guess what that makes makes you do? You're going to be highly ranked, and you're going to be in more key games. If you lose them, oh well, guess what? A lot of eyeballs are watching your games. They see you doing the whiteouts in a top 10 matchup against Michigan. They see you in the big noon game against Ohio State game day on both networks. If you're losing to teams like FIU, you're not in those games. So I would say it's much better to lose to the higher ranked teams for a while. Beat everyone you're supposed to beat, though. If you beat everyone you're supposed to beat, only thing that's going to happen is recruits are going to start to notice like nine, 10 wins, nine, 10 wins. And then eventually you're going to break through. And that's where you're really going to be. Look at Clemson. It took Dabble a while. He lost to Steve Spurrier how many years in a row? Keeps losing to them, keeps losing to them. But they're consistently in the top of the ACC, beating teams they're supposed to beat. And eventually he's able to build a program up. Diaz, I don't know. I don't, I'm like, I'm not confident in him getting that done. Like, I know Nick Saban had a loss his first year at Alabama to, like, an unknown school. So maybe he can turn it around. Who do you lose to? ULM. I think that's who it was. But again, they were coming right off sanctions. So, like, what are you going to do in that situation? I don't know. I don't like it. I like dancing and celebrating, but not during a loss. Not when you're down to FIU. Like, at that point... You should be trying to pump your team up. What can we do to turn this game around? And then you lose. So it's almost like it's encouraged. But um, I did have one more thing for college football kind of related to this. And it is the celebrations in college football. Because I was watching the Michigan game two weeks ago against Michigan State. And one of the receivers made a big time catch down the sideline, stood up and flexed. Did like a double bicep flex. And the ref threw the flag and said, hey, that's taunting. That's excessive. And the rules guy, I think it was on Fox. I could be wrong. It might have been on ESPN. Because you know how every network has like their rules guy. So the guy calls in. He says, yeah, it's okay if you are if you catch a big catch, you make a big play, and you do the first down signal. That's not taunting. But as soon as you raise... Two biceps, that's over the line. That's one of the ones they're looking for this year. You can raise one bicep, but you're not, you can't do two. That's taunting. So, so what happens last week or this past weekend, Michigan plays Indiana. I saw like three or four dudes do the double bicep flex. Guess how many flags I saw? Zero. So then I was like, is that in the rule book or not? I'm confused now. Should I be worried if my guys catch a big time catch and then do a double bi- bicep flex? Like, if you're a coach, how would you handle that? I would say you don't have big muscles, so don't flex. <laughs> Put them away. You're a wide receiver. You got to be tough. Just catch a ball. Just catch a ball and score a touchdown. You don't have to do all the extra celebrations. 
No. Those receivers wear Under Armour and it's loose on them. Don't you need to do. You need to do the celebrations. I I preferred. I don't think it was uh, Donald, Donovan People Jones that got flagged for it against Michigan State, but he did the Paul Bunyan pose last year that I thought was hilarious, where he he did the pose like the statue that they play for, hands on the hips, like the head cocked to the side. David Wasn't Boston, flagged. David Boston didn't do that. And he had big biceps. David Boston was so juiced up. Didn't his ankles break? He was not juiced up. What are you talking about? He wasn't juiced up. What are you talking about? I thought in the NFL they said that he put on so much mass through like whatever. He did the same thing Barry Bonds did, didn't he? Didn't he do the magnesium drips? He got to like 280 pounds and his ankles couldn't handle it. They just gave out under the pressure. I'm pretty sure I read that in the Balco tapes, Matt. We need a baseball rules expert here to come in and tell me which guys were caught steroiding back in the day. I don't have my Jose Canseco memoir, but I'm pretty sure David Boston was in that. <laughs> I feel certain that he wasn't. He, I think he probably did it the natural way. <laughs> and what is that? Lifting weights. Just Bring eating so much shit. that your body can't handle it and they have to get a crane to get you out of your house? Just just eating Papa John's. And sweating out garlic butter. <laughs> Did you see that interview with Papa John's? I was going to bring that up. That's my final bell. How many pizzas, Matt, have you eaten in a month? The most, like, like just think back through your entire life and thought, wow, I ate a lot of pizzas this month. How many pizzas would that be? Well, considering towards the end of my undergraduate career, there was a summer where I, I my whole main nutrients was eating pizza. <laughs> It was around when I had to go to work, so probably a lot. But Papa John's came out and said that he ate 40 entire pizzas in 30 days. <laughs> How is that possible? Because I thought, and I thought, uh, you know what? My max might have been, and I doubt this even happened, would have been like maybe eight. Because you're thinking two a week. Because you never eat an entire pizza in one day. That would be ridiculous. Like, what are you doing? Like, and I'm thinking like a, even a medium pizza, like whatever inches that is, 12 inches, 14 inches that like you can might eat a couple slices and then throw it in the fridge and you're eating that same pizza two or three days later. You're not eating an entire pizza more than one a day. So like I you wake up that back in the day, Matt, he's waking up, he's eating half a pizza for breakfast, half a pizza for lunch and half a pizza for dinner. And that's some rough math I'm estimating here to get those say, numbers. Terrible at math, but you can't have three halves. You're eating more than a pizza. Yeah, you're eating one whole pizza and a half a day to get the 40 pizzas a, a, a month. That's probably going to get you too much. So maybe like one whole pizza and a third a day. That's too many pizzas. <laughs> Hopefully he's getting like a thin crust, like weird paid like whatever like they have like the spinach crust like maybe he's doing that to stay healthy i just don't think he's eating like a pan pizza that would weigh you down so much well clearly he was not because it looked like he was just sweating out of garlic butter <laughs> which i'll put this on the southbound sports twitter so if you follow us southbound sports you'll be able to see it because I, I mean it was tw- trending today but i thought who signed off on that like didn't he have a pr person like doesn't he have a wife or a girlfriend that was with him that could have been like Honey, he, this isn't good. Like, what are you doing? This does not look good. Like, powder your face. Powder your face. And then, like, take a look at what Brady Quinn looks like on the Fox network. Full of makeup. Faces powdered down. And you see Urban Meyer, and you know that, like, okay, Urban, I got to give him credit. He's not wearing a lot of makeup on that set. If you compare him and Brady Quinn side by side, it's embarrassing how much Brady Quinn goes through and puts makeup on. Like, call him up, Papa John. Say, you're like, yo, I know the NFL career didn't work out, but how do you look so fresh on TV? You wear an eyeliner, mascara, I don't know my makeup. So to sit there and give an interview where you're drenched in sweat wearing a red shirt, people were saying he looked fat. I didn't think he looked fat. I just think that he looked poorly lit. He looked like a man that eats 40 pizzas. But Matt, he was testing them because he, he said that they changed the flavor. They're not the same. He had to prove it. He ate 40 different styles or whatever. He said those weren't good pizzas. 
How, at what point do you realize, well, these aren't really good. Why am I eating them? Day three? <laughs> no, day 30. How many did I actually eat? 40? Holy crap. He was proving a point. He did prove his point. I, I don't even understand it. I, I like how he threw people under the bus, too. He was saying that uh, some of the CEOs at Papa John's were trying to hook up with Rick Patino. Like, he just name-dropped Rick Patino. Because what did he do? He donated. Didn't Papa John's buy, like, the Louisville basketball stadium or something? It was the university. They had a deal with the university, with the football stadium, with, with the basketball, with everything. Yeah, he wanted people to know. He wanted people to know that he knew Rick Patino. So he made sure he brought that up. <laughs> Crazy. I don't even understand it. Uh, let's get back to football. College football playoff rankings dropped. Ohio State is ranked number one before the game this Saturday against Michigan. I don't know if they're calling this a big noon game. Is it on Fox or is it on ABC this year? I don't know. But it is... I don't want to say that it's inflated, but I wonder if they flipped Ohio state to number one to get ready for, I don't want to say they're going to lose, but I want to say that they want to keep the Rose bowl participant ranked high because I've been thinking about this. I think, I don't think there's any way Ohio state loses two games. I think they're in the playoffs no matter what, but by moving them up to number one, that means Penn state doesn't have to fall as far. If they would drop um, Ohio State down or keep them at two or three and Penn State didn't look that good against them, then, of course, you have to drop Penn State further. Look at what happened with Oregon. I think they bumped them up to number one because they wanted to say, look, Penn State's a quality win. Let's keep Penn State up because I don't think any West participant, and I'm sorry, Minnesota, if you beat Wisconsin this week and you get killed by Ohio State, I don't think they're going to pick you for the Rose Bowl. I just don't see it. Because I'm pretty sure the rules for the Big Ten are if the Rose Bowl champion is in the playoffs, they get to go, the Rose Bowl gets either their pick or they get the highest rated team in the college football playoffs. And if I'm looking at it, it's either going to be Penn State or it's going to be Michigan. If Michigan beats Ohio State, I think they jump up and they're sitting right there for the Rose Bowl. That's my conspiracy, too. The Michigan's sitting right there. They move Ohio State up to one. If Michigan knocks off the number one team, they'll move them up into the 7-8 range just so that they can take the Rose Bowl bid. And then when Minnesota loses to Ohio State, they'll say, ah, they lost by 30, so don't worry about it because it would be almost like a redemption game for Ohio State. So I think the Rose Bowl is going to be either Penn State or Michigan, and that depends on the game this Saturday. So if you're a Penn State fan, cheer for Ohio State on Saturday. If you're anyone else's fan, you just know Ohio State should just lose this game. Hopefully Michigan can get it done. I don't think it happens. I think Ohio State ro- runs them out of the building. I don't want to say that it's going to be like, what was it the one time, 42 to something, 21. I think it's going to be 35 to like 21. Two touchdowns, Ohio State. What are your thoughts? I think Ohio. I, I would. I actually want to see the Ohio State LSU matchup because I think those are the two best teams right now. I think. I think Clemson's going to make it, but I just think LSU is playing out of their gourd, and I think Ohio State showed that they just have talent coming out of everywhere right now. And I, w- I want to see what that matchup looks like because it definitely looks like they're they're at this point of the year they're head and shoulders above everyone. Well, I'm looking at it and I'm actually surprised if you look at the resumes. LSU should be number one. I mean, let's yeah. be honest. And the, think- the way they're setting this up, though, Matt, is it's almost like I'm wondering if they're going to let Alabama back in. Because well, that's, that's I don't exactly. think they give Ohio State that number one seed. Like if Ohio State wins now, they're number one. If they blow out Michigan, like I think, like a double digit win against Michigan is going to be a good win. The Michigan and Ohio State have been playing the best in the Big Ten in the month of November. So if Ohio State blows them out, this isn't a Michigan team that's going to overtime 
against Indiana like Harbaugh's first or second year, and they're struggling down the stretch, they're actually looking pretty strong. So this is going to be a solid win back-to-back. Penn State, then Michigan, then Minnesota or Wisconsin for Ohio State. That's like three top 10 wins back, like back to back to back. Like I could see them being number one ahead, like after that, but to put them there now, I don't think there's any way LSU jumps them. And it's setting up where they're going to play the four seed. Do they really put Utah there? Because I think <clears throat> the four seed, if it's Utah, that's a big step down. And the number one seed has a distinct advantage in the playoffs this year. I mean, because it's either going to be Utah or they put, what, Baylor or or Oklahoma in. Otherwise, you're looking at Alabama. And that's why I think they're going to say Ohio State, Alabama is a gigantic draw. We'll put Clemson, LSU in the other one. That's your playoffs. That's my feeling. But the thing that... And I know that I've railed about this in the past, but this this year more than anything, when you look at what what talent is in the SEC, I don't I don't understand how you continue to to just lump. LSU is definitely deserving of one or two, and take your pick, but then to leave Alabama and Georgia hanging around, and and even to a lesser extent, I I want to say Auburn's within the top. 10 <coughs> Ooh, excuse me I thought they were 15th but that might have been the AP poll yeah I mean the, they were they were somewhere in there but it's like once again you get these overinflated SEC numbers and I feel like when, when you compare that to what's going on in the in the big 10 right now where you have Ohio State that's clearly up there but then there's there's a cluster of teams that are are in that upper end of the the top 10 where you have Minnesota, you have Penn state and you have uh, Michigan that are all there that are knocking each other out back and forth. Why is it that when, when Penn state lost to Minnesota, that they dropped, they went from four down to what? Eight, 10. Was it that bad of a loss when you consider Minnesota was on the bubble of being in the playoffs at that point? Like, I don't understand how Alabama loses to LSU and they're sitting at five, but then Penn State loses to Minnesota, and they drop almost out of the top ten. That, that, that the discrepancy in that you're still playing a top ten matchup, top ten matchup. Why is it that, that they don't tumble as far? Matt, I'll tell you, it's the Big Ten shooting themselves in the foot. Penn State should never have played Minnesota for whatever reason. I've looked at the schedules, and they're sticking with the nine game schedule. But they have the most ridiculous crossover. For the past five or six years, Michigan's crossover is Wisconsin. They should not be playing Wisconsin every year and also playing Ohio State, Michigan State, and Penn State every year. It's idiotic. Take away the Wisconsin win this or loss this year for Michigan, and guess what? Their only loss is on the road after a drop pass to Penn State. They'd be ranked like number four right now. They'd probably be above Alabama, if we're being honest. And why do they have that loss? Why is Michigan playing them every year? Penn State's been playing Minnesota. Why is that game scheduled? I mean, the 2016 year, it took a Saquon Barkley run to beat them the year Penn State won the Big Ten. Why have that crossover game? Ohio State lucked out. They had Nebraska, and I believe that switches. I think Ohio State now, now is going to get Wisconsin and Michigan is going to get Nebraska for like the next six years or something crazy. Why are you playing these teams every year? I, I understand maybe you use that as bait to get Nebraska to join the conference. Nebraska has been playing so awful in the conference. They have been begging not to get that crossover game. We talked about it the other day. It leaked from Scott Frost's camp. Just drop it. Go to eight games. That's what the SEC has. They have one less loss for all their top teams. So instead of having Penn State with one loss to Minnesota and Michigan with one loss to Wisconsin, they only have one loss to each other. Michigan's is to Penn State. Penn State's is to Ohio State. Michigan plays Ohio State right now for the Big Ten Championship. It would would decide the league because you're getting rid of that crossover game. And I know Ohio State, they had Wisconsin at home this year. 
because it's part of that transition year or whatever. Who cares? Give them a, a lucky break. Like Michigan has played Minnesota for the for the brown jug. I understand if it's a rivalry game, but some of these games you're having crossovers that are tough for no reason. Why is Michigan going out and scheduling Notre Dame? Why? What are you doing? Are you trying not to make the playoffs? Because that's what it feels like to me as a fan. Ohio State, why are you scheduling Oklahoma? What are you doing? That cost you the playoffs last year. Was it last year that they lost to Oklahoma and then they had like two losses and played in the Rose Bowl? I think it was last year. Like, why are you doing that? It makes zero sense until the NCAA comes in and says, hey, everyone has to play this many Power 5 programs. And then even at that point, make it random. Why are you having consistent crossovers between the top teams in each division? It's dumb. It's dumb. And until the Big Ten fixes it, yeah, they have the most teams ranked in the college football playoffs, but because they all beat each other up, they're all ranked in the mid tens and, and, and teens. And so what's going to happen now, because they're all ranked so high, they're going to be placed in bull matchups, probably where they shouldn't be placed. And they're going to have a losing record again. I already know what's going to happen. Penn State, if Michigan wins, or even if Michigan doesn't win, they're probably going to be in a New Year's Bowl game, probably against Florida. Again, because why not? Penn State will be in the Rose Bowl against Utah because they're not going to make the playoffs. And uh, they're going to be probably at a disadvantage. It's like, why, why are you putting all your teams at a disadvantage? It makes zero sense to me. Why? That's, that's what I would want. I want to go into the Big Ten Conference and just say, why? Like, what, what are you trying to accomplish here? Is it so you can beat your chest and say, yeah, we beat Nebraska this year? Who cares? But there is something to that argument because we've had this, this discussion before. And I, I think part of it is when you look at Alabama's schedule and you look at the schedule right now, because of their lack of competitive team in their non-conference slate, it, it is hurting them in some aspects right now because there's not a tested team. And like when you look at Alabama, what's hurting them right now? The fact that their one marquee matchup, they lost. So they have nothing on their resume now to show why they would be a good fit in the playoff. Reputation aside. And I'll say this, they're supposed to take injuries into account. If Fields went down, there's no way Ohio State would be ranked fifth if they had a loss. Like Ohio State should not be there, or Alabama should not be there. They have an unknown quarterback. Why are they sitting there whenever you have all these other one loss teams that have better resumes? It's all bullshit. And that's why I want to see an expanded playoff with auto bids. Because right now, you have a lot of conference champions that are going to be left out. You could have one loss. Oklahoma, one loss, Utah as champions that aren't going to be in the playoffs. And right now they have Alabama, a one loss non-champ ahead of them. And you really can't give a reason why. And that's why I'm hoping this year breaks it. Like I'm hoping for mass chaos. I want Michigan to beat Ohio State for reasons other than the playoffs. But I, I just want it to be closer. More teams with one loss so that it's not clear. If LSU would lose to Georgia and Ohio State loses to Michigan, what would they do? Hell, what would they do if Clemson lost? Because Virginia Tech's been playing pretty good. If Virginia Tech beats Virginia, I think that they're going to be in. Virginia Tech eliminated Pitt. They killed them. I mean, for a team, Pitt, right there, you have a chance to win your division, you get shut out. That's embarrassing. But that, that that didn't surprise me because with that being Bud Foster's last game and it being a crap field, rainy conditions, everything was set for Virginia Tech's situation. They they talked about Beamer Ball and how Foster was there, and they're they're scoring defensive touchdowns. When I saw they were up fourteen nothing, I knew it was a wrap. There was no way that they were going to do it. It's just Narduzzi plays straight out with Antonio mindset 
that they're going to win with defense, and if it comes down to the offense making plays, they're screwed. Yeah, that's why I think that when you're looking at it from a fan perspective, I don't know how some of these teams, you could throw Pitt and like even Iowa in there now because I, I went on the rant about losing teams you're not supposed to lose to. Iowa does that for a sound coaching as they are. They should not be in one-score games with like Northern Iowa and teams like that. Northern Illinois, you're you're losing to like stuff like that. Like why? Why is Pitt running an offense that puts them at a disadvantage? Pitt should be trying to do whatever West Virginia did and reinventing themselves because you're not getting pro style guys to walk through that door. Anyone that's that big and athletic that's good enough to run a pro style offense in college is gonna get pushed by Ohio State or Michigan or Penn State. Because that's what's gonna happen. Everyone knows it. So Pitt, do something different. You're not going to be able to straight up head to head, and maybe you'll get a couple wins. You might beat Penn State every couple of years or Clemson every couple of years. But is that what you want the ceiling for your program to be? I don't get it. I want mass chaos this week. I don't think it will happen. I think Ohio State will rule. I think LSU has A and M. They'll probably rule that one. And then you're going to be really hoping that Georgia beats LSU. If Georgia beats LSU. And then you have Georgia, LSU, and Alabama there with one loss. I don't know what they do. I want to see it expanded. Do I, I would hate. I would hate an 18 playoff. Because I think if you're going to get the same bullshit. Could you imagine this year if that did happen? And then you have the five champions and then the rest of the uh, at large BSEC teams. Because that's what they'd be sitting there doing. The, the eighth team would either become Florida or Penn State right now? Who, who are they putting in? Because so Georgeville's heading for a loss this week. I would laugh if that happened. Anything to move it's, Michigan it's, up? Well, it's possible to happen because the last time that Florida beat Florida State at Florida was back when Tebow was there. It's been a long-ass time. That's kind of embarrassing considering Miami's been having such a good streak against them. <laughs> so, Anything you got for the final bell? Just a little bit of an annoying thing during the Penn State game. The announcer is talking about how who who was it? Hamlin. Hamler. Yeah, is that who it was? KJ Hamler. I don't know what you're going to say. So you know exactly what they're going to say because they're talking trash on the wing tee. Oh yeah, I do know that. They said um, I, I forget who was it Hamler that they talked about because I thought Hamler was. Highly recruited, they just weren't sure because he was undersized, and I think he got injured. Couldn't remember which player it was, but they're, they're like, no, his high school program ran the wing tee, and that's why he wasn't highly recruited. That's such a stupid thing to say, because it doesn't matter. There's, I think they phrased it as an extinct offense, Matt. Uh, they did, and that's because they're morons, don't know better. And it, it actually it, it triggered some some PTSD from when I was in North Carolina because there was a year where we transitioned and we were still we were starting to incorporate some gun concepts. So we'd run our under center crisscross where it was for people that, that don't really know it's the double handoff play and um, you'd have people going oh not that reverse and then we'd get in the gun we'd run the exact same play exact same blocking the only difference would be it would look like the quarterback was faking the handoff and then pull it. They're like, oh, they're running zone read. And we're like so excited. It was like, no, you idiot. It's the same damn play. <laughs> but just people just don't know and just perceive with what they what they believe it to be. And, you know, you see stuff like uh, with what uh, Lamar Jackson's doing with the Ravens. They're running wing T guard trap. And they're, they're running some of these other stuff. And it's like, no. They're, they're running these innovative concepts. Like, no, you're running the same stuff. It's just packaged differently. It's not extinct, but because it doesn't fit in the traditional box, we have to complain. It sounds so, like it's extinct is what I'm hearing. Oh, oh piss off. That's my final bell. <laughs> no, I actually, I forgot to mention this. We, we, uh, we had a little wager, was it two weeks ago now, where I said Northwestern would never cover against UMass and you doubted Pat Fitzgerald's old school offense. And you said they were going to get the 40 point win. 
And that did not happen, Matt. It was so close. It was so close. <laughs> I I looked at it and I thought, wow, because you know what it reminded me? Northwestern, they uh, they tried to hang with, was it Minnesota or Wisconsin last week? I think it was Minnesota. And I thought, wow, a Min- Northwestern doesn't look as bad as what I thought they were. They should have covered that 40-point spread, but they didn't. Because if you're just hanging around, holding on to the ball, they were losing at the end of the first quarter, weren't they, in that game? It was bad. Yeah, It was bad. That's a Pat Fitzgerald for you. That's another team that's like, I know you're supposed to be fundamentally sound. You don't get the good recruits. Do be, they be like a diverse offense. They used to be kind of like passing spread and they were doing some stuff like that. Go back to that. What are you doing? You can't just man up in power. You're going to get destroyed. Because what was funny is they had a close game with Stanford, I believe, at the beginning of the year. And now both those programs are complete shit. Like what has happened? They, uh, they bumped Notre Dame from the, was it the ABC game? They are now yeah. showing Utah and Colorado. And I always get a lot of questions about Notre Dame. And I text you immediately when I saw it because I said, that's going to be the downfall of Notre Dame because everything's so playoff heavy right now. And we talked about it like, oh, why does it matter if they play eight games to nine games? They don't care about a tough schedule. You should care as a, as a team and as a coach and as an athletic director, zero to one loss. That's your only chance right now of making it into the playoffs. Maybe two losses on like a strange year. Why make it any harder for yourself? It's much better to be Notre Dame and get into the playoffs and get killed than to not make it at all. Because guess what happens? Your recruiting bumps up. You're able to get some other guys you come in, and then it happens again. They have a hell of a year this year. Their only losses are to Georgia and Michigan. They could have very easily been in that discussion if they hadn't played one of those teams. If they had not renewed the Michigan game, you know what Notre Dame would be looking at right now, Matt? Another playoff berth. Think about it. They had a close loss to Georgia. They would have been right up there. They would have been in the top five. They probably would have been ahead of Georgia at this point after the South Carolina loss going to be the new coach at Florida State. So that'll be... Who's that? Brian Kelly? Yeah, he wants to get out of South Bend and get get down to where the weather's warm. I thought they were hiring Butch Jones. No. We're not hiring five-star hearts. Uh, I guess my last, my very last thing is Greg, Shia, or Greg Shiana supposedly turned on Rutgers. Did you see that? Yeah, because they wouldn't let him have his own plane. Well, I heard a couple of different things. It, I don't think it was just the plane. I think the plane was for recruiting purposes, but he also wanted a football facility. And like a lot of the stuff he wanted made sense. If you're going to compete in the Big Ten, you either pay for it or you, or you lose. Yeah, but there's there's ways of going about getting that stuff. That it, it almost like when you see the list, knowing that their Rutgers is a crap shoot program that is not focusing on anything athletically right now at all. There's no way that they're going to invest the type of money that he wanted into the program. Yeah, but he's coming from Ohio state. So he probably just made a list of everything that they have. And he's like, I remember Rutgers. We didn't have any of this stuff. So he probably just wanted, and maybe I don't know if his contract said it had to be done immediately. Maybe in the course of, I think the big sticking point that I read after the fact was that he wanted a guaranteed eight years. I think. Which, if you're Rutgers, why not? Because if that's your actual sticking point, that he wanted eight years guaranteed, and in that same eight years, you're starting to get him a jet, you're starting a, a practice facility, you get some indoor equipment, why not invest in your team? Because they're still not getting paid their full amount from the Big Ten. What are they going to do? They're either going to have to go the discount coach route, and number one, not buy any of that stuff that Shauna wanted anyway because they don't have the money and wait until the big 10 payout start or invest now, try to get a jump on it. So that when the big 10 stuff starts, you start paying it off or maybe get investors engaged a little bit. But I I just don't see it. Like if they're not going to give Shiano the stuff that every other school in the big 10 has, what are you doing? Just, just drop down. Like if you're not going to be when the big 10 money starts flowing, if you're not going to invest in your program, like I, I, at that point, I would say kick them out. And I'm not for kicking teams out, but what are you going to do? 
or at least compete in other sports. Like the women's basketball coach at Maryland in that list I shared, she makes more than Mike Loxley does through state money. That's guaranteed money because the booster money probably comes and goes. So, hell, she has a top 10 program, at least she had. So invest in whatever else you can get wins at. Do something. But that's the end of the show. Thanks for listening. Go to southboundsports.com. We'll be getting into some football coverage as we get into the championship games. It's rivalry week. Make sure you hate on your rival. And we will see you next week.